In today's lecture, what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, formally uh, derive the uh, condition for uh, the onset of uh, viscous fingering. So, we just laid the foundation for Darcy's law, etc., in the last class, and uh, we'll go about the formal procedure. So, the procedure is basically the same as what we've been following earlier. We uh, write down the model equations, find the base state, do the linearization, and uh, get a relationship between the growth constant and the wave number, okay. And uh, that basically is uh, what we've been doing to find out under what conditions an instability can occur. So we'll follow the same procedure again, but then the specific problem that we are going to apply to is this viscous fingering problem. Okay, and uh, the idea is that we have, uh, let us say, a vertical uh, geometry. So we are having viscous fingering. or the Safman Taylor problem, the z axis is vertically upwards, okay. gravity is downwards and uh, let us say this is fluid 1, this is fluid 2, this has properties mu 1, rho 1 and this has properties mu 2, rho 2. And, uh, let us uh, just solve this problem, okay. Um, actually, uh, you can have different permeabilities also in both the uh, geometries, but I think what we will do is we will keep the permeability the same throughout, okay. So, we will just say that the permeability here is k and the permeability here is k. Okay, so now what we want to do is we're going to use Darcy's law, and Darcy's law basically tells you that the z component of velocity, the z component of velocity is u z, is going to be given by minus k divided by mu times the gradient of p plus rho g z. Because this is plus here because g is acting in the negative direction. You have to check with your notes in the last time what we had, it was that the component of g was coming. So now g is in the negative z direction and therefore this is plus rho g z, okay. So when I go back to the Navier-Stokes equation, I have minus dp by dz plus rho g z, that's with a minus sign. And so I can group these two together. And this I can write as plus gradient of phi. That's what we did last time. So basically what I'm doing is I'm writing the velocity component uz as the gradient of a potential and uh, the potential is essentially, we compare these two equations, there's also a scalar minus k by mu times p plus rho gz. That's your potential, okay. Now the base state whose stability we are interested in finding out. The base state is, base state has a flat interface and this guy is moving, let us say at a constant velocity, so you are pumping liquid and let us say that uh, the velocity is uniform across the channel, so we will just look at the velocity as being uniform and some capital V, okay. So we have a uniform velocity in the 
z direction. Okay. So, what is going to happen is the base state is the one where the interface keeps moving. So, the inter interface keeps moving, like I said earlier, is going to be an unsteady state problem. So, what we can do is we can convert this to a steady state problem by just working in a reference frame which is also moving at a velocity v. Supposing you are sitting on this reference frame and let us say at time t equal to 0, this is at z equal to 0, I am going to define a new coordinate z bar which is z minus v t. So, this is my moving reference frame. Okay. moves vertically upward at a velocity v. Now, so in this reference frame, what is going to be the location of the interface? The location of the interface is going to be given by z bar equal to 0. Okay. So, z bar equals 0 represents the location of the interface. Okay. So, Basically, the interface will have moved up, but then when it moves up by some distance, I am looking at z minus v t as the location. So, z bar is 0 always. And uh, in this moving reference frame, clearly, what is the base velocity? The base velocity, which is your state, the steady state velocity whose stability you are interested in finding out, what is that? That is also 0 because you are moving the fluid is moving as a plug V, you are also moving along with it. So, in that reference frame, the base velocity or the steady state velocity is 0. Okay. The steady state velocity equals 0 in this reference frame. Right. So, now we do the usual stuff which is do the linearization about this base velocity, okay. which means the u vector I am going to write it as the base velocity which is 0 plus epsilon times u tilde. Okay. And this of course, is a vectorial uh, tilde. Now, just like we say that the actual equation is going to be u is going to satisfy Darcy's law. So, that means u tilde will also satisfy Darcy's law. Okay. And uh, therefore, we have what? Um, u tilde is going to be given by, I am going to work in terms of this potential gradient of phi tilde. Okay. That is, that is a perturbed, there is a potential phi tilde whose gradient is going to give me my u tilde. Okay. So, u tilde represents the perturbed velocity which is of order epsilon and phi tilde will also be of order epsilon. Remember that. So, phi tilde is of order epsilon and what you also have to keep in mind is that you actually have u1, u2 phi 1, phi 2, phi 1 for the potential in one liquid, phi 2 for the potential in the other liquid. So, that is something you need to keep in mind. So, I have uh, for each liquid, each phase, I have u i tilde equals gradient of phi i tilde and this is of order epsilon because these are my perturbations. Okay. Clearly, 
u tilde has to satisfy my continuity equation for so divergence of u tilde has to be 0 divergence of u has to be 0 for so divergence of u tilde has to be 0 at the order of epsilon so divergence of u tilde has to be 0 and I can combine that with this for each of the phases and which means that divergence of u tilde is del square of phi i must be 0 for each phase ok. So, basically what this means is del square of phi i tilde must be 0 for i equals 1 comma 2. This is my linearized equation. Now, we would uh, like to actually solve this equation, it is actually a partial differential equation x, y, z and time ok. So, although we have kept the uh, thing as independent of time in the differential equation, the time dependency is going to come through what? Through the boundary condition. The boundary condition when the interface is getting going to get deflected, you can have the location of the interface changing with time and you will be using the kinematic boundary condition which has the time derivative. So, through that boundary condition the time dependency comes in ok. So, whenever you are talking about the linearized problem it has to be an unsteady state problem only then you will know whether it is growing with time or not. Now, we have to go back and uh, solve this analytically right. So, we have to make those simplifications which we have done earlier which is we are going to assume that the system extends to infinity in the x and y direction ok. System will extend to infinity in the x and y direction. So, which means I can now seek solutions which are periodic in x and y of the form e power i alpha x x plus i alpha y y ok. And uh, what I will do is I will go back to my uh, interface my z bar is going to be when I am going to be deforming it z bar equal to 0 is my base state ok. Z bar equals epsilon times h of x comma y comma t is the location of the perturbed interface. Okay, z bar equal to f 0 is the base state when I am going to give a perturbation it is an epsilon h. So, if you wanted to write it in terms of this implicit function you would write it as z bar minus epsilon h of x comma y comma t equal to 0 because this is your starting point for getting the kinematic boundary condition and all that ok. Ok, so now we are going to assume h to be of the form h star e power sigma t e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y. So, the disturbance I am giving to the interface is periodic. I can give an arbitrary disturbance. I am resolving it in different Fourier modes ok and I am trying to find out which of these Fourier modes is going to increase or decrease. So, like you are resolving a vector on different components ok. So, this is it and this is the growth with time and this is h star which is the amplitude. So, if this is going to be the form of the uh, disturbance at the boundary then clearly my phi i also is going to have the same periodic form ok as far as x and y is concerned only the z direction I have to find out what is going, uh, going to happen ok. So, in the uh, as far as the phi i is concerned phi i tilde is concerned. So, phi i tilde is going to be of the form f i of z bar comma t e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y ok. So, remember phi i is p d e in x y and z x and y components are like this z and time 
dependency is captured here. I am going to substitute this form in my del square equation. I mean, this is what we have been doing earlier. When I substitute this in the z square equation, in the del square equation, what do I get? I get d square fi by dz squared. Okay. In fact, this I should possibly write it as dou squared. Minus, when I differentiate with respect to x two times, I'll get minus alpha x squared minus alpha y squared. So minus alpha x squared plus alpha y squared times f i equal to zero. Okay, is this clear? All I'm doing is substituting this in the del square equation because because del square phi i is equal to 0, we get this for each of the i's and clearly I am going to just combine alpha x square plus alpha y square into some alpha squared. Okay. So, alpha squared define alpha squared as alpha x squared plus alpha y squared. Let this be the case, then I have d square f i by d z squared minus alpha squared f i equals 0 which means f i remember will be of the form some constant into t because that constant will now be a function of time because that is what uh, where my time dependency is being absorbed. Okay. So, I am going to uh, call this g i of t times e power alpha z. In fact, I should be slightly careful. Let me just do one thing. Let me just uh, use some something else. Okay. So clearly, this is the solution to this equation. I mean, this is a linear equation with constant coefficients. Assume solutions of the form e power alpha z. Put it here. This is what you get. So, now I need to find out, I need to get these constants. Clearly, very far away, we, we are having also a situation where there is no boundary condition in the z direction at minus infinity and plus infinity. I want things to be bounded at minus infinity and plus infinity, right. So, at z equal to plus infinity, and that is where my first fluid is, first fluid is on the top, f 1 is bounded. So, that means this guy has to be 0, implies a 1 of t equals 0, clear, because a 1 of t is not 0 at z equal to, this actually should be z bar, no? this should be z bar, yeah, this should be z bar, because I am working in the moving reference frame, uh, and a 1 of t must be 0, okay. And clearly at z equals minus infinity, f 2 is bounded, which implies b 2 of t equals 0. Okay. So, essentially what this means is, it means um, phi 1 of t equals what? f 1, f 1 is b 1 of t e power i minus alpha z e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y e power sigma t. Okay. I mean phi 1 I wrote as f times this, f is the z dependency I am now breaking up into this exponential in this and that. Okay. And uh, phi 2 of t is a 2 of t. e bar alpha z bar, I need to remember to put this bar on top. Okay. 
Okay? So what I have done is uh, just use the fact that uh, phi is defined as follows and uh, fi is going to be a, no, there is no e, e power sigma t, there is no e power sigma t, you are right. Yeah. So fi is that and the time dependency I am yet to find out, yeah, okay, that is right. So, I think everything is fine. So, this is valid for z bar greater than 0, this is valid for z bar less than 0. Now what? I have got to find these two fellows, B1 and B2, right? And of course, uh, I need to now start using my boundary conditions. My boundary conditions which are going to be necessary are my kinematic boundary condition and my normal stress boundary condition. Like I told you, although we have viscosity here, we have a potential flow situation, okay? Which means it is something like an inviscid flow, but then viscosity is present. So, I am trying to get the best of both worlds, okay? So, we have to use the normal stress boundary condition and the kinematic boundary condition. So, rather than uh, me go back and derive what this kinematic boundary condition is from first principle, you know how to do it. The kinematic boundary condition comes by looking at this and saying that the material derivative is 0, okay? And then you can uh, equate terms of order epsilon. So, now what we will do is the kinematic boundary condition boundary condition gives what the vertical component of velocity equals ds by dt, okay. The vertical component of velocity is now d phi 1 by dz, that is my perturbed. In my perturbed reference frame, v is my base state which is when things are flat. So, if I am looking at quantities which are of order epsilon, okay, what do I get? At order epsilon, I will get the perturbed velocity in the z direction w1, w2, okay will be related to ds by dt. Now, this is something you guys have to go and derive. I am not going to sit and do this. We have done this for the earlier problems, okay. So, just find the, put the kinematic boundary condition using the same method as before and what you will get is the vertical component of the velocity is d phi 1 tilde by dz equals d phi 2 tilde by dz because this is, remember, velocity is equal to gradient of potential. That is how I had. So, the velocity in the z direction will be d phi 1 tilde by dz, that is my vertical component, that is my, these two have to be equal at the interface, okay, and that must be equal to dh by dt, that is my kinematic boundary condition, okay, and this is equal to dh by dt, and this is at order epsilon, because h is already at, at, of order epsilon, this is also order epsilon. So, now I am going to substitute for h in terms of this equation here. And I am going to get, when I differentiate this with respect to time, I am going to get sigma times h star times e power sigma t times e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y. That is my d phi 1 tilde by dz, this is my d phi 2 tilde by dz. In fact, uh, remember guys, this is not only phi 1 of t, this is also a function of x, y and z, okay. This is phi 1 completely. Okay. So, what I am going to do is, I am going to use, I know phi 1 and phi 2. I am going to find out d phi 1 by dz from here. I will get minus alpha times that. So, this is yeah, things are fine. I am hmm? going to substitute here d phi 1 by, I am going to find out d phi 1 by dz and find out b1 in a2, okay. So, b1 of t, so what is d phi 1 by dz bar? b1, okay. Remember that is a function of time and then there is a minus alpha e power minus alpha z bar. Okay, times e power my i alpha x x plus alpha y y. That is the derivative I have. Okay, must be equal to 
sigma h star e power sigma t e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y. Okay. Now, clearly this guy is the same as that, so that cancels off since we are looking for uh, non-zero there. And uh, the question I have now is, z bar remember is of order, um, where is the kinematic boundary condition going to be applied? It is going to be applied at z bar equal to epsilon h. The kinematic boundary condition is applied at z bar equal to epsilon h. Okay. So, now if I, were, if I were to substitute this at z bar equal, equals epsilon h and what I would have is something containing epsilon here. So, basically you do a Taylor series expansion and that is your domain perturbation method that you have you saw earlier. So, you have e power minus alpha epsilon h, you evaluate it at the base state plus epsilon h, right. So, what I am saying is e power minus alpha z bar can be written as the thing evaluated at 0 which is 1 okay, plus the derivative of this which is minus alpha times e power minus alpha z bar multiplied by z bar. Okay. So, point I am trying to make here is uh, basically I am just explaining the domain perturbation method which you people have seen earlier. This term is of order epsilon. So, when I substitute this here, this is not going to contribute and I am going to essentially evaluate this at z bar equal to 0. That is the story. Okay. So, I am going to evaluate this at z bar equal to 0, although ideally I am supposed to evaluate this at z equals epsilon h. Okay. So, when I evaluate this at z bar equal to 0, I, uh, I mean this is basically approximated to this. This is of order epsilon and therefore, I have minus alpha b 1 equals sigma h star e power sigma t. Okay. So, b 1 of t is nothing but sigma h star e power sigma t divided by alpha with a minus sign. You can do the same thing for the everything is okay. You can do the same thing with the other fellow d phi 2 by dz because I have just used this equal to that. I am going to use this equals this and then I am going to substitute this expression for a 2. This minus is not there. So, what I am going to get if you believe me is a 2 of t equals plus sigma h star e power sigma t alpha. That is the time dependency that I have. Okay. So, let me just write this thing neatly once. So, phi 1 of t, what is that? phi 1 of t turns out to be b 1 of t which is minus sigma h star e power sigma t by alpha Okay, that is my expression for phi 1 and phi 2. What I need to do is I have basically relate, uh, related my amplitudes a 1 and a 2 in terms of h star. I, what I have to do now is find out conditions for which h star is non-zero. So, the only thing remaining for me to use is 
the normal stress boundary condition. The normal stress boundary condition is going to be basically saying and remember we are going to be working, we are looking at the limit of surface tension not existing, no surface tension, okay. We can include the effect of surface tension, but right now for simplicity we just say surface tension is not there. If surface tension is not there, that means P1 must be equal to P2, the pressures are equal at the interface, that is the simple thing. And uh, for all practical purposes, we are not going to worry about the normal contribution because of the viscosity, because we are just saying this is something like a potential flow, okay. So what I am doing is going to say P1 equals P2, P1 equals P2 at the Z bar equals epsilon H, this is the normal stress boundary condition. Um, so what is P1? I have gotten things in terms of phi1 and we know the relationship between pressure and the gradient, right? I mean, um, what did I write? Minus K by mu times P plus rho g z right equals phi is this right please check hmm? so if that is the case that this implies p1 equals minus mu 1 by k phi 1 minus rho 1 g z Okay, I am just, I am now, I have to make sure I put the 1 and the 2 in the right place because that is going to make a difference, right. So if I make a mistake here, I am going to really mess up. So P1 is going to be for the first fluid, mu 1 by K1, phi 1 minus rho 1 GZ. And similarly for P2, P1 P2 What I have to do is I have to put P1 equals P2 because that is my pressure which is going to be equal. If P1, if there is surface tension then P1 equals, uh, P1 minus P2 equals sigma del dot n, that curvature I have to put, okay. So now I am not going to worry about surface tension. This is with surface tension equals 0. P1 is, yeah, this is row 2, yeah, this is row 2, you are right. Uh, P, this is the total pressure, the actual pressure at the interface, okay. So now what I found is P1 tilde, the perturbation. Remember these guys what I found out, all the written P1 here, these are the perturbed quantities, okay. So, yeah, I put a perturbation here, but for some reason I forgot the perturbation here. So, these remember are actually perturbations, okay. These are all perturbations. So, what is the relationship between phi1 and uh, what is the base state phi1? The base state phi1 is uniform velocity v, which means what is the base state phi1? It is Vz because V phi 1 by Dz is V, that is my vertical component of velocity. Phi 1 is therefore V, phi 1 is my base state plus my perturbation plus epsilon phi 1 tilde, okay. Phi 2 is V plus epsilon phi 2 tilde. And what I need here is the actual potential, you understand? So what I have to do is put P1 equals P2, put these two guys equal, I, the, I will tell you what, what I am going to be doing. I am going to be putting Z equals epsilon H because this boundary condition is evaluated at Z equals epsilon H, okay. So I will get an H here, H star here. Phi1 and Phi2 already have things in terms of H star, okay. I am going to equate these two guys. and I am going to use the condition that I want a non-zero H star and that is going to give me a relationship between 
sigma and my properties and that is my stability condition, okay, that is the plan. So, that is the uh, way we are going to go about doing this, but phi 1 is also not right, is not it? This is, that is the V z bar because the derivative of this with respect to z bar is my base velocity which is V. Z bar it is not there. Pardon me? Z bar it is not there. In z bar In it the is? In new reference frame V is not there. In the new reference frame? So, it should actually be a constant. Uh, what should be a constant? Z bar should not be there, phi, phi 1 is just a constant in the ref Phi 1 is? Just a constant in the Z bar frame. Phi 1 is a constant in the Z bar frame. Yeah, one second, one second, that is not right, okay, I will tell you why. Um, uh, because <laughs> uh, in the moving reference frame, yeah, yeah. I am not changing my reference frame, I am keeping my reference frame as it is. So, this is, let me do one thing, let me go through the algebra first and then, then I will come back and address this question, okay. Um, so, one more question which I have to address. So, what I am going to do, yeah, yeah, I need the V because if there is no V that means there is a, the condition has to have the V in it. Um, there is a reason for this. Let us come back to that. So, let us just do the algebra right now, okay. I will explain to you why the thing has to come. Uh, d phi 1 by dz, no, what do I need to do? I need to substitute this back here. P 1 equals P 2 is mu 1 by k phi 1 plus rho 1 g z bar equals mu 2 by k phi 2 plus rho 2 g z bar, okay. So, I am just removing the minus sign, I am just saying these two have to be equal, that is my normal stress boundary condition. And uh, mu 1 by k, what is phi 1? I am saying it is v z bar plus epsilon times phi 1 tilde which is over here, phi 1 tilde is minus sigma by h star e power sigma t by alpha y, okay. equals mu 2 by k v z bar what is this? P2. So, that is these two have to be equal, okay. And what I am going to do is this has to be used at z bar equals epsilon h, okay. Now, the same st uh, stuff here, z bar equals epsilon h, I am going to substitute for h in terms of my h star exponential i alpha x x i alpha y y, okay. And this is epsilon equals h star e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y times e power sigma t. I am going to substitute this expression for z bar, then what do I get? I get a term here which is of order epsilon, 
okay, because z bar is of order epsilon. I get a term here which is of order epsilon. This is of order epsilon, this is of order epsilon. This guy has e power minus alpha z bar and there is already an epsilon multiplying it. So, what I need to do is I need to evaluate this at z bar equal to 0 because the next term the Taylor series expansion will give me a higher order term. So, basically I am going to evaluate these two terms at z bar equal to 0 that is my domain perturbation method okay? and I get uh, these guys will go off and all these guys will have uh, e power sigma t e power i alpha x x i alpha y y. So, all this e power sigma t will push off you understand. So, basically what I am saying is when you substitute z bar equals epsilon h in uh, all terms put e power minus alpha z bar as equal to 1 okay, in the middle term because I am using the domain perturbation method and you cancel off all this e power sigma t e power i uh, alpha x x alpha y y. Okay. Uh, what you are going to be left with is mu 1 by k, k times v times h star minus sigma by alpha h star plus rho 1 g h star equals mu 2 by k times v times h star v times h star plus sigma h star by alpha plus rho 2 g h star. So, basically there is h star occurring in all of this. I want h star to be non-zero because only then my perturbation is non-zero and that gives me a condition in which is going to relate sigma and alpha. Okay? We have mu 1 by k into v minus sigma by alpha plus rho 1 g equals mu 2 by k into v plus sigma by alpha plus rho 2 g. Okay, I am going to keep all my sigmas to one side, move all my sigmas to one side and I get sigma by alpha, remember sigma by alpha is together multiplied by mu 1 plus mu 2 by k. I am moving this guy to that side and now mu 2 by k so sigma okay let's leave this as it is okay this is the relationship between sigma and alpha the growth rate and the wave number in order for you to have a disturbance, the sigma by alpha is going to be related by this. Clearly, as alpha increases, sigma increases linearly. What is the condition for stability? Sigma must be positive, right? Uh, sorry, sigma must be negative for stability, sigma must be positive for instability. That is, if you are going to have this kind of a perturbation which is going to grow the viscous fingering to take place, sigma must be positive. Okay? So, basically what it means is sigma must be po in positive implies unstable. That is, fingering will occur.
So, when is finger, okay, let us assume that the densities are equal, okay, clearly both density and viscosity are playing a role, but to begin with to find out the effect of the individual things, let us assume that the densities are equal, if rho 1 equals rho 2, clearly mu 1 must be greater than mu 2, okay for fingering to take place. That means, if you have oil and if you are pumping water which is your second fluid, first fluid is oil which is there and remember 2 is my second fluid which is water. So, the viscosity of oil is greater than the viscosity of water, you know, I am using water as my fluid which is most likely to happen, okay. then you will have viscous fingering, you will have instability. So, basically what it means is, if the um, more viscous fluid is being driven out by a less viscous fluid, we will have fingering. Of course, even if for example, I did this problem in a vertical frame that is why this g showed up. Supposing you did not have this thing in a vertical frame, you had this thing in a horizontal situation. If you have the flow in the on the displacement in the horizontal direction, then that gravity term is not going to show up, okay. So, even if the densities are different, the density is not going to make a difference for a horizontal flow, but this is the guy which is going to decide whether you are going to have fingering or not. So, essentially if you have a heavy viscous liquid where you are trying to push it through a push displace it using a less viscous liquid, you will get fingering. But if you have a water which is let us say less viscous and you are trying to displace that with oil which is more viscous, the interface is going to remain flat, okay. So, basically I just wanted to elucidate the role of viscosity here okay as the one which is actually causing the fingering. I want to give a physical explanation all these equations are good, but at the end of the day you need to have a physical explanation. So, let me do that and uh, see this is my flow okay and this is my flat interface okay. So, I am trying to give a physical explanation. Supposing you give a small perturbation and what is the story here, um, mu low and let us say mu high, okay and this is the direction of the flow. Supposing you give a small perturbation because of which the interface gets deflected. The question we are asking is, is this deflection going to increase or is it going to decrease and become flat? Okay, so suppose there is an interface deflection. Will this amplify or reduce? That's the question. If it amplifies, it is unstable, if it reduces, it is stable. Let us quickly see what is going to happen. Supposing this is the deflection, remember I am having the same pressure drop at these two ends, okay. The, the pressure here is uniform, pressure here that is uniform. Now look at this situation here, if you look at this small section, the effective viscosity in the middle section is going to be lower than the effective viscosity here. Effective viscosity means you can take something like a weighted average. Here this let us say 50-50 and let us say this is 60 of this liquid, 60 of the low viscous liquid and 40 percent of the uh, high viscous liquid. Clearly the effective viscosity here is lower than the effective viscosity here. So, if the, you have the same 
pressure gradient, if the effective viscosity is lower, this guy will have a tendency to move faster. Okay, this guy will, so this guy will keep getting amplified. Okay, so point is mu effective is lower in the thin band, okay, and hence it moves faster and the thing gets um, amplified, okay. Okay, but uh, in the reverse case, I mean you can do this of course, suppose you give a small perturbation of this kind and this is mu high and this is mu low. What do you see? In the thin band, mu effective is high, so the velocity is going to be lower and this guy catches up, okay. Is flat. So my point I am trying to make here is, I mean one, just like you have competition between different forces and stuff like that, you have competition between different effects. So you have to do the mathematics, you have to also try to understand the result physically whether it makes sense, okay. So that is basically the moral of the story here. Now regarding this uh, phi, we will have to see, I will have to come up with an explanation tomorrow as to why it is happening. I just want to finish this up, so tomorrow we will uh, discuss why v z bar has to be there. But clearly you see if the if v is 0 then my condition is not going to be dependent on this. So, I knew for sure we had to have the v but I, I need to come up with the explanation now. I think in the z bar frame.